Hello, everybody, and welcome. The Atheist Experience is live April 27th, 2003. It's my birthday. Ah, happy yes, birthday. Thank I you. did not know this. Uh, this show is sponsored, as always, by Atheist Community of Austin, a nonprofit educational organization promoting positive atheism and the separation of church and state. ACA holds weekly meetings every Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. at Hot Jumbo Bagels, except for the first Sunday of every month when we hold our lecture series uh, in the mayor room of the Austin History Center downtown at the corner of 9th and Guadalupe. And uh, next Sunday will be our next lecture series. And our speaker at that time will be a fellow named Don Baker. No, it won't. No, it won't. Oh, that's right. I'm thinking a month ahead of myself. That's yeah. right. It's going to be uh, officer elections that's time. Yep. Don Baker will be our first our speaker in June, yes. speaking about uh, Christianity as a meme. Yes. And uh, that should be very interesting. He's spoken about memetics before. And uh, so that should be pretty interesting overall. Um, we're getting some interesting kind of stripey distortion on our monitor in here. Hopefully it's not coming out that way at home. Uh, anyway... Uh, Let's see, what other announcements have we for the group? Well, as always, there is uh, Godless Gamers, which is Monday nights at the home of Russell and Virginia Glasser at 7 o'clock p.m., and Atheist Happy Hour, which is Thursday evenings, starts about 7.30 p.m., trickles on all evening long, people come in and out, and that's at Antonio's Tex-Mex near the intersection of I-35 and Highway 183. Thursday evenings for that. The Nonprofits, which uh, was our uh, week, uh, weekly internet radio show, um, pardon me, uh, that ran all through 2002, is coming back to the airwaves, or to the bandwidth, uh, as it may be. And the return date on that is May the 10th, Saturday, May the 10th, and uh, Jeff D. and Jeff Jones will be um, on the first show, and I don't know if that will be the regular uh, uh, crew, but uh, in any event, May 10th is uh, the day that that returns, and uh, will be from 2.30 to 4 p.m. at the atheistnetwork.com website, and it will be an MP3 stream, I do believe. Uh, so uh, that should be a lot of fun. The way they had it set up uh, last year, uh, I'm sure they'll be doing the same thing this time, which is there will be a live chat room that you can interact with the program while it's going on, and then, of course, uh, every show will be archived, and you can uh, stream it off our website at atheist-community.org once that's, uh, once that's ready. So uh, very happy to have the nonprofits coming back. So uh, May 10th is the day for that. Now, uh, the University Atheists and Agnostics, a uh, registered UT student organization. Uh, and who, Crystal Strickland is the president. Hey, Crystal. Ah. Uh, and uh, they're uh, getting into their sort of groove, you know, uh, yes. getting, finally, you know getting, getting some structure uh, to it all. And um, I guess this semester is just about done. And so they're ready, I guess, for... Will it be operative in the summer, or is it just going to be in the fall and spring? Not fall, so uh, they're going to take the summer off like you know, all smart college students would do, and then come back <laughs> in the fall and uh, all kinds of fun there. So for more information about the University of Atheist and Agnostics, if you're a UT student or faculty member, the uh, email address is uaa at mail.utexas.edu, and they're putting a website together, and as soon as that's ready, they'll let us know, and we'll tell you what that is. So uh, loads of fun. Uh, okay, uh, sorry about last Sunday. We weren't on. Uh, it had nothing to do with scheduling stuff. It had nothing to do with uh, the fact that it was that there was some uh, you know uh, uh, Christian holiday named after a pagan goddess going on. Uh, we would have been perfectly happy to go on, but uh, some members had some uh, some personal obligations, so we just took that Sunday off, and we're back. Uh, we are live today, and if you've never watched this show before, it's a live call-in show. We are on for 90 minutes, and we take questions from folks like you. Uh, and we also take viewer emails. Now, this has uh, been a new regular feature of the show. And, uh, however, we have uh, figured out that there was a problem with the feedback, the viewer feedback email address, tv.atheistaffingcommunity.org. Uh, apparently, uh, it, uh, emails were bouncing. It was bouncing emails. It wasn't set up properly. Russell fixed it very quickly. And now it works. So if uh, you want to send us uh, any email feedback about this show... There's the address to do it, tv at atheist-community.org. And uh, if, you know, you've tried to send stuff in the past and had it bounce and you still, you know, demand an answer, then uh, go ahead and send that again. Why not? We'll get it this time. And uh, speaking of the viewer emails, well, we've got one this week. One managed to slip through. Uh, a viewer named Taylor Ehrlich, he says, Hey, guys, I love your show. Uh, thank you. I was wondering what your thoughts were on freedom of speech in the classroom, specifically when dealing with religion. Uh, I go to UT, he says, and today in class, this is interesting, we were all giving presentations on our statistics projects. One guy concluded his presentation with the typical question-answer format, as we all did. However, 
he went out of his way afterwards to say that the most important thing he could say was that he owes everything in his life to his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I personally thought this was inappropriate. You don't see me standing up after my presentation to tell everyone that the most important thing I can say in the context of my statistic project is there is no God. I don't know. It just seemed really uncalled for to me. I'm curious about what you guys think because I recall a discussion you had about the minute of silence in schools. You mentioned, well, there went our sign. Uh, the minute of silence in schools, you mentioned that it's unnecessary because it's perfectly legal for students to conduct prayers and have spiritual activities in between classes and after school. Yeah, the Constitution doesn't prohibit that. What do you think about this sort of thing happening in the middle of class, as in this case? I'm a strong supporter of freedom of speech. My favorite band is Pearl Jam. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a pretty free speech there. But isn't there a point where one should draw the line? Anyway, I'd love to hear your take on this, Martin and Ashley. Well, our take on it, Taylor, is that this was an evangelical Christian doing what evangelical Christians really love to do, which is rub your nose in it. Uh, it's showboating. Right? Yeah. You know, just this public of display of piety. Look at me, look how Christian I am, aren't I great, aren't I cool? And he wants a reaction, he wants a response. I mean, that's, that's really what it is. Um, and I, Best you know, thing to do is probably ignore it. Yeah, exactly, that's what I was thinking. You know, it's because what he, if he gets a positive response, from, you know, then he gets to find other Christians like exactly. himself, and, and he, he gets, feels good that way. He gets pushed on to do it again. Yeah. And if the he next gets, time he has the statistics project. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then if he gets a negative response, then he can... Uh, probably cause a big stink like the the thing that happened recently at Texas Tech with Professor Dini yeah. not giving the uh, the uh, letter of recommendation to the creationist student. So the creationist student cries foul, says, oh, yeah. this is religious discrimination, and I'm going to He gets to be a hero for his faith. Although that has yeah. since blown over, the whole uh, Texas Tech thing. Yeah. Uh, the, gov- the government's backed off on that. Although I would point out, though, that he has the right to say that. Oh, sure. At the end of his project. Yeah, the First, it's, the it's first kinda... Amendment does not pro- prohibit you from being a, a, a nuisance or an idiot. <laughs> <I> mean... <laughs> exactly. It's, it's kind of inappropriate, uh-huh. especially given the topic. I mean, it, it's not something that really you should come out with. Yeah. But he's perfectly legal. He has every right in the world to say it if yeah, he wants to. But, I mean, but like, why does he think just, anyone point? in his statistic <laughs> class would care exactly. that he has this invisible friend that helps him out with everything he does? You know, what's it got to do with what they're all there in class for? Again, it's just, it's showboating. Yeah. Uh, so, um, you know, I don't... Statistically know. speaking, there is no God. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, so that's what we think of that, Taylor, and thank you for watching the show and, and uh, being a fan and all that good stuff. Yay. Uh, hmm. So that's it for viewer emails, and if you have one uh, at the end of the show, uh, like I said, this is a live call-in show, and we get lots of calls. We never get around to everybody. There's usually people hanging on at the end. Or sometimes people are shy to call, whatever. There's the address. Fire us off an email, and every week we'll pick the most interesting emails, and we'll answer them live on the air. Okay, so thanks so much uh, for your viewing, and now it's over to Ashley for the news, isn't it? Okay. What's happening in the world on my birthday? All right. Like commemorating and great parades and Yay. ticker tape stuff and, <laughs> and all that. All right. Uh, first one. Now, you would typically assume that if the, the people who do the reports on education in your state came to you and you were a senator and said, wow, your state is doing really, really well, mm-hmm. you know, you're doing excellent, you would be happy with that. Not everybody. <laughs> uh, senator Mike Fair, who is in South Carolina, I, yeah, South Carolina, uh, he is a little bit tick, ticked off right now. Is he? Yes, um, he is irritated that a study done for the Fordham's Foundation gave South Carolina an A for how well it teaches evolution. (laughs) Uh, He is challenging the premise of Darwin's widely accepted theory. He bases his argument, now get this one, he bases his argument on the fact that no one was there when life began to make a scientific observation about it. (laughs) Ah, so since, so since nobody was standing around this little pool and saw a fish jump out of it, uh, then, it's, it then it's not a scientific theory. It's pure speculation and religion. Mm-hmm. Uh, Fair wants science books in South Carolina public schools to have the following statement posted in, in them. The cause or causes of life are not scientifically verifiable. Therefore, empirical science cannot provide data about the beginning of life. Hogwash. Yeah, well, I mean, he doesn't understand about... Hello? What's that about? We're not taking calls yet. Okay. Uh, they're, they're, going, they're playing what's this button do in the control room. Uh, yeah, I mean, he doesn't understand about there's a, there's a, uh, a particular scientific te- technique of scientific 
uh, investigation that's called post-diction. Yeah. Okay. And this is how we know about how things like the Big Bang took place. Yeah. Okay. Like yeah. the reason we have the way we've been able to confirm the Big Bang is because you take a theory like the Big Bang and you say, okay, if this is how it happened. Yes. If this is how it happened, what would you expect to see today? Yes. As an indicator that this was what happened, right? I mean, everything leaves a trail. Yeah. Okay. And if you expected, you would expect to see certain conditions, you know, A, B, C, D, present in the universe today, uh, if the universe is the result of this big quantum event, like the, the Big Bang, like exactly. massive expansion. Okay. And as we examine the universe today, we are in fact finding those conditions. Yes. Okay. So this is how scientists can conclude, okay, that that's, uh, that that's what happened as a result of, that's what caused the universe to come into being. Now, how is it that we're able to conclude that life forms evolved? Well, you know, you're able to trace it back. Yes. You know, and so we I have think the science that, of genetics. So I think that the first thing this senator needs to do is he needs to enroll in junior high school. Yeah, apparently and some take of the a few public fundamental schools. class. Yeah, he needs to take some classes, some of these classes that are doing so well in evolution. Exactly, they're teaching these things. So people. that he'll know what the hell it's really all about before shooting off his mouth, uh, you know, with exactly. a bunch of nonsense. Exactly, and sounding like a moron. Yeah. His argument is that no one can prove scientifically how life began, which makes the question a matter of faith or philosophy. Darwin's theory that life evolved slowly over millions of years, he argues, is not science. Fair said his intention is not to inject other theories of origins into the public school curriculum or teach religion in the schools. Which is a fat lie, but, you know. Even though he believes Darwin theory is foolish and Mm -hmm. is a religious belief in itself. Yeah. His goal, he says, to stimulate discussion. Well, And what was the last one he said? My intent is very simple, that the truth be taught in classroom. If if they're calling something science... See, there you go, right? I mean... eh, Truth. Uh, and if they're calling something science, they be able to back it up. That's uh, what me. Well, excuse me, moron, yeah. but the they stuff... They do the, have science. Yeah, it is backed up. That's why it's the prevailing scientific mm. theory. Just because you don't like Idiot. it or don't understand it doesn't mean it's not real. Okay. So, okay. go back to public school. Yeah. Get some of these students... You'll learn. Get some of these school students who know what the hell they're talking it about. to you. Exactly. <laughs> Gosh. Yeah, and for so. him to claim that he's not trying to push a religious agenda is, of course, you know. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, the only pe- people who have any objection to evolution are creationists. And okay. creationists are religious. Yeah. You know, he, he, he perceives that there's something in there, something in the school curriculum, that is threatening the religious indoctrination that he wants everyone in his state to have. Of course. So, sorry. <sighs> you know? Okay. And now the next story. This one's in Florida. Um, a woman with bipolar disorder is suing her former boss for religious harassment, claiming he blamed her disorder on unconfessed sins and fired her because it was God's will. <laughs> uh, Subwick, which is the woman who was fired, mm-hmm. w- who is a Christian, claims uh, the boss told her that the d- disorder resulted from Satan infiltrating her life. <laughs> he advised her to pray daily with him, but she was fired when she, sc- when she stopped the sessions. Mm-hmm. Uh, the boss was also sued in January by a former producer who alleged she was fired because she complained that the company put scriptures inside paycheck envelopes. Mm. So this is a guy who apparently has a history of doing some wacky religious things. You know, it's like they've just always got to be in your face about it. Yeah. It's like, you know, they just, they have this uh, congenital inability to leave people alone. Yeah. You know? And bipolar disorder, it can't possibly be, you know... A chemical imbalance or genetic or oh, no, something no, like you're, that. You're possessed, it, right? you, Yeah, I, I mean, you just it. haven't gone to church enough. Yeah. The thing um, to do is find some, you know, pigs to drive your demons into and have them run off a cliff. <laughs> exactly. You know, like Jesus did. That's, yeah, that, that, that'll that cure them uh, much quicker than any you know, drugs. What is wrong with so. our species? You know, it's not just worry. Yeah. Like... And it's not going to stop anytime soon. Well, that's depressing. <laughs> Thank you. Boy. Yeah. Uh, last story. Mm. Okay. This is a woman in central Thailand. Uh, their son, who was 12 years old, died a couple years back um, in a car accident. At the funeral, they found a lizard, a monitor lizard, sitting underneath the picture of him. And it allegedly followed them home. Hmm. They assume that this lizard is the reincarnation of their son. Now the lizard has died. Oh. And so they're having a big funeral for, for the, the lizard. lizard. <laughs> for the monitor lizard. They have a picture of their son uh-huh. and the dead body of the lizard. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, the, the lizard was found lying under a, under a photograph of Sharon during his funeral in 2001 and reportedly followed the boy's parents to their home. So. <laughs> okay. Um, whoa, what, what can you say about that? Uh, <laughs> Reincarnation. Well, I guess, you know, monitor lizard. I, I guess, you know, how nice for the lizard that he got this great send off. But uh, true, because you know, otherwise he might just gotten eaten by some sort of. You know, Although it prey. does. Well, but, who actually knows? It does say in here that they fed the lizard on yogurt and bread, I think. And if that's what they fed it on, that's why the lizard died. <laughs> Probably, yeah. <laughs> it's a rather insect-poor diet there, isn't it? Yeah. Exactly. So, so they oh, probably well. killed the lizard. Okay, you know, now that's... You could say that that kind of thing may be a little benign, and it's sort of, in, in some ways it's a developing country. Of course. But, you know, what is depressing is when you get similar attitudes in a country like ours that is supposed to uh, yes. be a little advanced, uh, scientifically and technologically yeah, advanced. We are a world superpower. You know, but, uh, you know, the more the more scientifically advanced we become, the more there is this um, uh, resistance and backlash uh, among uh, the religiously hysterical, like this foolish uh, <laughs> senator. You know, yeah. what is so incredibly arrogant about this, right, is that, uh, you know, this is a guy who clearly doesn't know the rudiments of biology. Okay. Exactly, and yet he is being so arrogant as to presume to sit there and lecture authoritatively, yeah. like he's some world class authority on the subject yeah. that he can just declare this isn't no science because it's got no evidence behind yeah. it. Blah blah blah. When any first year you know biology one hundred and one student could sit him down and go, okay, look, here's the evidence. Da 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 da. Yeah. Okay. You know, and not so, just that he doesn't understand the basic principles yeah. of science. Yeah. Yeah. Let he alone, let alone, you know, evolution. Yeah, and and we have found that we have found in every instance, like when, when some creationist has called this program, yeah. right, and tried to give his objections to it, it's very clear this guy hasn't, you know, taken a biology class since junior high school. Exactly, fish don't just give birth to dogs. Yeah, just doesn't so. know. These are people who just don't want know what they're talking about. And yeah. I, look, look, it's perfectly all right if you want to go through life ignorant. That's fine. Yeah. But it's extremely arrogant and presumptuous to then presume to be some authority on some yeah. subject that you're completely ignorant about and say, yeah. no, 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 this isn't how this works. When obviously your motivation is religious in nature, you have a set of beliefs of and a set of rules and a set of dogmas that you want people to stick with because, you know, they're good enough for you. Yeah. And so uh, that's what it, uh, and so it becomes, the resistance becomes really all about that, but he's masquerading as if he really knows what he's talking about, and he, do, and he doesn't. Yeah. If you're going to argue against something effectively, mm-hmm. you have to know what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. You have to read their material and learn things. And that gets, brings us and to I, our people pal, haven't done that. Dean James Kennedy. Now, uh... D. James Kennedy is um, <laughs> just going to do this aside. We'll go ahead and put that number up now for phone calls. Live, live call-in show, so go uh, um, uh, call us up and we'll get those calls lined up. But I uh, <laughs> recently there was some discussion on uh, the, our, our uh, mailing list, internet mailing list, about um, D. James Kennedy, who is the uh, pastor of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church. Yes. And he heads Coral Ridge Ministries, and this is out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And this is, this guy is very much a mover and shaker in Christian fundamentalism today. He's got the ear of, of the White House. Uh, and this is, uh, so this is a guy who's held to be an authority in Christian fundamentalism. Yes. And, uh, he has his, one of his most infamous activities is lending a lot of financial and material support to Judge Roy Moore in Alabama, yeah. who is the bigoted judge who threw up this hideous <laughs> Um, Ten, Ten Commandments Ten display Ten in flagrant violation of the Constitution. And yeah. he knew it, we, what he was doing was a violation of the Constitution. Yeah. That's why he snuck the thing in in the middle of the night. And allowed okay. these people to videotape it yeah. and then sell those videotapes to cover the cost of defending himself. Yeah, which is a whole new concept <laughs> that in, in jurisprudence that I've never heard of. It's like, <laughs> no, that, videotape, wow. videotape your crime, okay? And sell it on the And internet. then sell the tapes to, for your legal defense fund. That's, uh, you know, wonder, it's a wonder that O.J. Simpson didn't think of that. But anyway... Um, so uh, th- there was some nonsense on his website, and somebody posted a link to it, and I was looking around the guy's website just kind of shaking my head <laughs> in uh, you know, dismay, uh, which is what rationalists tend to do when they visit fundy websites, and <laughs> saw this book uh, here, and then I found one at a local used bookstore, so I snapped it up because it was really cheap, and I ah. thought I would take... This is an example of uh, modern uh, Christian apologetics. This is a book called Skeptics Answered. E. James Kennedy wrote, th- wrote this. It is a Sounds sort of like the case for faith. Type it's book. a it is it's that type of book. Yeah. It's you know it's like that. It's like uh, Josh McDowell's books, and um, it is uh, the the complete text without the afterwards and the appendixes and his bibliography, which is two pages long, 
um, is 160 pages. So in 160 pages, he wants to refute skeptics. But this is, a, it, I just, I picked this up to see, okay, exactly what sort of arguments are being put forth by, you know, somebody who is considered, you know, the, the yeah, um, authority. Yeah, yes. and uh, you know, the, the cream of the intellectual crop, intellectual crop, as it were, of Christian <laughs> fundamentalism. And I'm three chapters into it, and um, my refutation that I'm writing right now <laughs> is not quite as going to be as long as the actual book itself. But uh, it is just amazing that this is a parade of fallacies. False assumptions, straw man attacks, yep. um, and again, just a whole lot of ag- arrogance uh, and I- ignorance. In fact, it's ignorance congratulating itself with arrogance. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so it, um, it's been a lot of fun, actually, to read this, just because, yeah. I mean, right from page one, I'm like, okay, there's a problem. <laughs> Let's back, okay, go back here. Ah, okay, yeah. he says this, but then that he says that. Okay. Yeah. So um, when my refutation is done, I'm going to post it on the website. Cool. Should be a lot of fun to read. Um, but uh, um, I, like I said, I was very, you know, I didn't want to order this online because it was like, yeah. they really, really charge way too much for this kind yeah. of nonsense. And for a gift <laughs> of so much, you'll get this book. Yeah, so. but, yeah. Why can't they just say this is what it costs? But I'm gonna, and also I think what I'm gonna do is donate the book itself to um, oh, the the library, the, uh, the library uh, yeah. our library, when it's all done with all of my uh, notes, ah, yes. as you can see. Well, handwritten notes everywhere. Yeah, just on every page. It's <laughs> Absolutely like, everywhere. I'll just give you an idea. Just give you a quick idea while the calls line up. Okay, this is just an example of you cannot even <laughs> trust this man with a simple, easily checked fact. Okay? okay, like right here in this, he try he he refers to the scriptures as God's dynamite, and he says that they're so forceful, right, that they can oh, just yes. convince anyone. And he, what he says is, the Greek word for gospel is the same root word for our dynamite. Okay. Now, after 90 seconds on Google, okay, I found out, no, that's not true. The Greek word for gospel, the Greek word for gospel and the Greek word word for dynamite are two entirely different words, okay? Two entirely different Greek words. So, um, <laughs> gospel is from the old English godspell, which means good news, which is a translation from a Latin, which is a further translation from a Greek, which is different. And um, dynamite, the root Greek word, is dynamis. So, again, right there, if, if he shoots his credibility on page 21, <laughs> by just stating an open falsehood, that's yeah. easily checked, very yeah. easily checked, uh, you know, there's, you, you can certainly cast doubt on the rest of it, and the further I read, well, the further doubt I cast it. As you can see, just the notes keep going. So, um, yeah. anyway, I'll be sure to announce it to when uh, I... Uh, yeah. I actually went on the website, uh, that link that was posted was to an audio clip. Now, you've been working on a refutation of Lee Strobel, right? <laughs> Case for Christ. Yeah, yes. <laughs> sort of. Well, why don't you finish that and we'll put yours yeah, up on I'll the thing. Yeah, I'll have to do some time. Yeah. Um, but I listened to this guy's argument. He, uh-huh. he does lectures and such, and uh, they have online, you know, how to debate an atheist. Okay. Um, and basically his idea of debating an atheist was, how do you know? Just mm-hmm. keep asking that repeatedly. Um, mm-hmm. And essentially it just comes down to a, l- a little kid's argument. Why is, this, why is the sky blue? Well, because there are gases in it. Why? Uh-huh. Because there's an atmosphere. Okay, so in other why? words, even if you get an answer, so, even, exactly. if you, even if you get an answer, you just keep Just say, parroting. how do you know? Right. Okay, which is just, which is not honest, any sort of honest inquiry. That's exactly. just playing games. And it could be played right back on them. Yeah. How do you know? Uh-huh. So, right. it, it doesn't get anywhere. Yeah, so, so. which indicates that they don't really want to know. Okay. Exactly. Just want to, he uh, even expresses that completely in the speech, which shut the hell out of me. Well, he just said... The, yes, he was, a, he was saying, you ask these questions and you're buying time because you know what they're going to say. <laughs> so you don't have to bother listening. Just know that you keep asking the yeah. same thing again and again. Yeah. So how do you know? <laughs> how do you know? <laughs> yeah. And don't bother listening to anything. I mean, you're not actually going to learn anything. Right. So... Mm-hmm. I know. Which again, uh, he he in in this book he criticized he he criticizes skeptics as being dishonest and not interested in the truth. Yeah. And then he advocates that kind of <laughs> you know juvenile activity. Yeah. Yeah. You know. So clearly, I mean, he's he's so he's not even making a pretense of not being a complete hypocrite and an idiot. Exactly. So, but anyway, this will be uh, should take me about another week or two to to get through this, and it, it's taking me more time to write my refutation. Oh, of course. To, to read. I mean, the book you can read in thirty minutes. It's it's so slight, but. Uh, <laughs> It's big type. Okay, we are now, we have call, calls ready to go, and, uh, okay, I think Thomas is online one. No, I don't know. Hopefully the phones still won't be making funny noises, but if they are, we'll just have to deal with it. Thomas? Hi, gentlemen. Hey, how are you Hi. doing? I'm doing quite well. All right. Good. How are you guys doing? Well, we're all right. Um, I will uh, be glad to read your reputation to that uh, book. Mm-hmm. 
So it'd be very interesting. Mm, it should be fun. <laughs> uh, so what do you want to talk about? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Have, you still there? Have we lost you? No. Okay. Okay. okay go ahead. Well, there's a little distortion in the phone lines. We've been having that problem for a few weeks now, but oh, okay. just stick with us, and uh, we'll 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 hear you. We'll. Yeah, I can hear an echo. Yeah. Uh, Sorry about that. What I was calling about, uh, there's a you know a hot debate about the budget, the uh, state budget, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, how to how to spend the money for. Education. Mm -hmm. Yes. And with the Republicans uh, slash theologists, or the theo uh, the uh, yeah, the theocrats. Theocrats. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, they want to. It appears that they want to starve the public education system so that uh, we can have vouchers and send them. Well, I understand it's it's uh it's there that is a, a great concern that a lot of this is motivated uh, by the far right and the religious right as an attempt to sort of give religious private schools a leg up, as it were. Uh, right. There are right. there are other objections to vouchers apart from that though, uh, and that is that it's um, it, the there are certain public schools that do very very well, and there are other public schools that don't do very well. Right. And I think that it's, you know, on the one hand, you don't just want to say, okay, let's throw money at everything and the problem will fix itself. I think there has to be more of, a, of an infrastructure reevaluation in terms of how public schools are even set up. Yeah. Uh, and, and this gets all the way down to the facilities themselves, uh, the quality of, of the textbooks, the, the credentials of the teachers. Yeah. I mean, we have teachers who aren't qualified to be teaching. Well, that's kind of what this bill was proposed. Uh, addresses is that uh, the uh, teachers don't have to be qualified in there's any subject they don't have to be educated um, it's very distressing no, it's just it's nuts to me I mean it's just nuts <laughs> Maybe it just makes no it sense it is nuts but yeah. when you have a, a legislature that has the R's by their name uh, that's what we get Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it kind of ties into uh, I forget the senator's name that came on and said that you know that uh, gays are equal to people yeah. that Sense actually bad. that is not true. That is not true. I've looked into that one. He never said the word gay at all ever. It was the columnist who wrote the article who put that in there in brackets. Oh, okay. And so he never said the word gay. Well, that's why I like so, your, your show. You guys didn't like so, me. Okay. Are now, that's like, completely off topic, of course. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's not like, well, it, uh, it's not like religious right politicians haven't bashed gays overtly in the past. Right? Exactly. I mean, you had Trent Lott comparing them to kleptomaniacs. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so that's a... Yeah. But, yeah, it's... Uh, well, the religious, religious right and the Republican Party tend to show their colors every once in a while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I don't mean to turn this into a political but that's just my no. Yeah. Well, I mean that there it's it it only becomes that because there are people on the religious right, on the far right of the Republican Party who want to politicize religion when the uh constitution is very clear that religion is not something that the 
government can't stick its nose in. It's not a business that the government is supposed to get involved in. It is the business of uh, private citizens to make those kinds of decisions for themselves. What faith do they want to practice? What faith do they want their children to practice? Or not? I'm right there with you. Yeah, and, um, and in, in the interest of promoting theocracy, uh, you'll, you will hear uh, anti-church state separationists uh, talking about things like, oh, well, the Founding Fathers only wanted to avoid uh, having a state religion, and the, you know, but that's not to say that the, they can't do any religious endorsement at all. Uh, but then they'll come right out and they'll have something like the National Day of Prayer, and, uh, and then the minute a Jewish group says, oh, we'd like to be part of that, they're like... There's also uh, a website where George Bush has a, uh, uh, a site where you can join a prayer group, and it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. it's set up by George Bush, our president. This state, state, or, uh, well, I guess, state-sanctioned prayer okay. by George W. Yeah. Bush, our president. I've heard of groups setting them up, you know, to help him out, um, which some people would argue that's all that could help. Um, but uh, but I haven't actually heard of one that's done by the president. So yeah. that's, well, that's news, but... You know, you, yeah. have, you have John Ashcroft having prayer circles in the office before yeah. work hours. Yeah. You have a lot of other Republican politicians around the country in... in their government offices in the state buildings, having their Bible studies and having their yeah, you know, and uh, and you can say, well, it's before you know they're not on the clock. And it's like, yeah, but fine, but it's the property, okay? The property yeah. is state owned, and I have a, a, a sneaking feeling that if the atheist community of Austin called these guys up and said, hey, you know, we'd like to use one of your empty conference rooms, exactly. uh, you know, in the evenings <laughs> to have uh, our little you know uh, yeah. evolution lecture, they'd be like, you know, fo, dude, you know, I mean, that would be the attitude. <laughs> yeah, that, so, that would be a big. Yeah, 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 I think yeah. they yeah, that would be <laughs> this is, how do how do we put this? Oh. Well, <laughs> so, thank uh, you guys very much. Yeah, well, thanks okay. for watching, and yeah. uh, you know, uh, just uh, call us back sometime. All right. Okay. Take Bye. care, Mike. So, okay, um, and again, we are sorry about this distortion. What it is, as you can see, oops, we lost our sound. Um, these are new phone boxes, and ever since and ever since we've got the phone, the new phone boxes work great. But well, there it goes. <laughs> it's just tired. It can't stand up anymore. Uh, it, there has been some, I guess, incompatibility issue with um, yeah. the control room. They've been working control on panels. it. Control panels. They've been working on it. Some yeah. days it works fine, others it doesn't. Today seems to be one of the days it's not. But we're going to keep taking calls, and we're going to keep, keep trying to understand what you're saying to us, and we'll answer you. And again, there's always TV at atheist-community.org if you want to answer, uh, ask us any more questions via email, and we'll read them on the air and uh, do it that way. I think, do I, am I talking to Gerald or Jay? Jay, Jay on three. Okay. Yeah, you're on the air. Hello. Hey. How you doing? I'm going to just, because the other night I watched the, I guess about a week ago, we watched that uh, major network put on a program about uh, Mount Carmel, Waco, when they interviewed the children that survived. Oh, yeah, from Waco? Yeah.
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The guy cars. Yeah, they have this feeling of being entitled, right? They yeah. feel like we are out there doing the Lord's work, and so we have these entitlements. We're entitled to ruin the quality of life in this neighborhood by throwing up a big parking garage. We are entitled to have our beliefs replace science education in the schools. We're entitled to this and entitled to that. They have this feeling of entitlement. And so because of that, it is very hard to sort of confront them on a calm, rational level and explain to them, well, no, you're, you're wrong for this reason, that reason, and the other reason. And then going back to what you said earlier about how amazing it is that people could still believe that, you know, that, that David Koresh was Jesus Christ and still think that he was some special guy. Yeah, it is amazing. It never ceases to amaze me the extent of just the human willingness to believe things that aren't true, but if, if it fulfills some strange emotional need yeah. that they don't think they're getting fulfilled elsewhere in life, they, a person will attach themselves to something no matter how crazy it is. It could be in, just lunatic beyond you know, the, the dreams of a mental patient, but, but they'll, yeah. they'll, they'll uh, embrace it. And it, it really, you know, you, you think you've heard it all, and you haven't. It all goes back to how people can compartmentalize their life and their mind. As in, these are people who are perfectly rational during the day. If they believe that David Koresh was a god or Jesus or something like that, if, if you take that belief and you take that lack of skepticism and lack of logical thinking and across their entire life, you would not trust them to tie their own shoes. Um, but mm-hmm. somehow they can, you know, be perfectly rational people. They can go about their day-to-day life, no problem. Mm-hmm. They just have this one wacky belief off to the side that somehow protects itself. Yeah. Um, and that's how most people are, you know. I mean, they believe these strange things, mm-hmm. and but they can still be perfectly normal people and perfectly good and all that kind of stuff. It's it's yeah. strange how they just, you know, block this one second off, one section in their mind off mm-hmm. from any rational, skeptical, logical thinking. Yeah. Just does not apply over here. Yeah. Whereas they'd be perfectly happy to um, their their political ideas, their exactly. their attitudes towards the news. Exactly. Or they'll any, argue that and yeah, debate they, that. And, they could have yeah, yeah, they could they could be be skeptical about it. In such. fact, overly skeptical sometimes. Yeah, yeah. The more the more devout the protected belief system is, the more hysterically skeptical yeah. and critical they might be of anything else that doesn't reinforce it. Yeah. Case in point, creationism. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, go ahead. Well, the uh, only I think is what gets to me till you read the book of Job in the Bible. Mm-hmm. You gotta be the perfect Christian. If you do, then you're gonna go to the hereafter and all this stuff. Well, he was according to the book of Job. Yeah. But yet, they look what happened to him. I mean, he was given a this. I don't know. But, hey, anyway. there's nothing that makes sense and to me as far as what I'm really looking at because I, I'm sorry. It sounds cold sometimes when they look at things. I know that there, I feel like in my own meditation, I'm like, I'm an Indian. The Indian background. I feel like, yes, there is something that's strong out there, a spiritual. To me, that is not like the Christian book, but there is something that I feel like that is greater in my life. And I look at it as a form of a guide to me to make me go down and walk. Mm-hmm. The daily processes of life. Mm-hmm. It's also because I know I'm not supposed to have murder someone through all this and that and everything. But you see, I always do. Oh, I went there to found God today, but yeah. But yeah. Then, so hours they could kill somebody and rape them or do whatever they've done. Yeah. Well, you know, we we know that a person shouldn't go out and live a violent life of crime either. And uh, for us. Some sort of divine belief is not necessary to uh, to understand that concept. It's enough uh, that you know the rational basis for cooperating with your fellow man. So, uh, in any event, but listen, uh, the distortion is getting really, really bad. We're, we, I enjoy talking to you, but okay. I'm afraid that we're. I'm going to try to see if they can fix this because this is nuts. Uh, it's, and there's got to be. It only comes on this number. Okay. Well, this and this is the number we got. So. Um, I know. I mean, but on the other program. Yeah. Well, I'm going to yeah. see if something can't be done. If you're on the line right now, holding to get on the air, just continue to hold, and I'm going to see if our producer can't get a little bit of help. Thank All right. You. Thank you. All right. Uh, so, line two, keep holding just for a bit, and um, if it looks as though there's any possibility that they can do anything to tweak that sound, because after a while, yeah. uh, Jay just got uh, in completely, uh, uh, in, you know, 
couldn't understand a syllable that came out of his yeah, mouth. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry about this, you know, I mean, having the, uh, but, uh, but then again, there's always Tifi at atheist-community.org if you don't think you'll be able to get in. Uh, so, so what can we talk about in the interim while we're waiting for some word from the control room that uh, either, okay, this is great, or, oh, no, we can't do anything about it, so just keep <laughs> taking calls? Uh, what, else, uh, what else is there in the world? Let's see. Um, the only other story that I had, I didn't, don't have it with me in paper. Uh-huh. Um, they had an editorial uh-huh. about 40 years after Madeline Murray O'Hare. Mm-hmm. Uh, she, they were... Essentially saying, in the good old days, mm-hmm. um, they had prayers in school, and they would bring out the Bible and read from the Bible in public school and stuff like that. And you had colored having to sit in the back of the bus. Exactly. And you had the yeah. mafia. And separate And you had one out of fountains. every six adults yeah. uh, being a drug addict. Yeah, yeah all the good old days. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, okay. we miss them. Yeah. Um, See, so again, there's this, this weird revisionist <laughs> history where, like, everything Life was, was perfect back then. Everything was peaches and cream so. from the 50s back. Okay. Yeah. And yet, if you look at actual actual history, the actual statistics, crime statistics from those days, right? Like the 1920s was such an insanely crime, uh, high crime decade. Yeah. That it's called the lawless decade by historians. That's what they. <laughs> that's a, it's not the Roaring Twenties. Actually, call it the lawless decade. Yeah. There were so many murders in this country. In fact, uh, there were yeah. uh, in 1926, the murder rate for St. Louis which is not even the largest city in America, not even back then, <laughs> was higher than the entire country of France. Okay. Whoa. So that's, you know, bad, right? So, the, so to say that America was this idyllic Christian paradise before yeah. this, hor- this horrible woman, Madeleine Murray O'Hare, came along and yeah. took prayer out of schools and now everybody's criminals and doing exactly, drugs and having yeah. sex. It's just stupid. Again, it's this, this, yeah. this goofy rewriting of history that only the most uncritical Pinhead who just yeah. never sees fit to read anything for themselves yeah. would buy into. Yeah. But again, it's part of this this is this agenda to theocratize America. Yes. You know, we, we got to get yes. that Christian Taliban in power. And not it's... only does he just say he wants to be able to have prayer back in school, which uh-huh. is perfectly allowed right now. Um, as but long he... as it's not like yeah, the school, school itself sponsored. isn't doing it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but basically, he's saying that our children they don't have the right to pray. Like, All their rights lie. have been stripped away. Fat lie. Exactly. It, you know, it, there is, is absolutely possible? no basis in truth. For is it, it possible None. for for anyone on the religious right to make a point without engaging in a deliberate out and out lie? No, because they, they have no points. Yeah. They have no valid points. Yeah. I mean that that is just <laughs> that is just what is really that can just turn your stomach about the whole thing. Yeah. It's like they just cannot state a position without a complete distortion or a complete falsehood. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So. And 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 who and what is the reason for doing that? What is the reason for lying to someone to get your point across? It would be only if you you know that you could not persuade someone to come along to your point of view if they knew the truth. Yeah. That if if this if someone you're trying to persuade somebody of a particular point of view. Yeah. You you've got to adjust yeah. their view of reality. Yeah. And so to the, fit with what you want it to look like. Mm-hmm. So you won't have to make any valid points. You won't have to actually prove yourself. Yeah. You can just, you know, distort so anyway, reality. So what all, what all did, did this uh, so, the, the, go on to say? Uh, that was really the main, the main thrust of it, is that, you know, our yeah. kids have no rights to pray in school. They can't be religious. They, you know, have to be completely secular. And, and, uh, and now we're trying to fight the good battle to bring back our kids' rights to pray again. Oh, it's stupid. Um, of course, you know, you can, you can pray. You can, you can, you can drop to his knees between class and pray until he's exactly. blue in the face. Right. Exactly. Grab Again, a couple of his friends and go along with them. This is what I would like to know. Why do? Why does the religious right feel that their religion needs government endorsement? Exactly. To what be about valid? the word of God isn't good enough? Yeah. For people that they need the government to come in and push it on them. Yeah. If God can't stand up himself and he needs George Bush to do it for him, okay. there's a problem. Okay. I'm having a hard <laughs> time reading that because it's being backlit by the. Um, Let me hear. So, so just uh, okay, and tilt a little towards uh-huh. the camera. Ah. Fred. Okay. So. Um, no. Harold. Okay, so... Gerald. Am I led to believe that the phones no. are tolerable? Private Geraldo. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, I got it. So, line two then, and it's a, supposedly the sound is better? We don't know. We'll find out. Okay. All right, we're hearing something over that mic. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to take line two, guys. Hey, you're on Hello. the air. Hi. How are you? Uh, wow, that's just... That, that sounds like we're in a... Some really... Pod people. Very intense. Yeah, okay. That's well, good. That's a little better. Whatever you did, stop doing it. 
That's okay. <laughs> go, 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 ahead and, you. go ahead and ask us your question, and we'll see if you uh, don't sound like you're coming from outer space. Okay. All right. Well, I was calling about the pressing issue. I myself am a convicted child molester, oh. and I was wondering if at all if the atheist morals go along with or, or do they not go along with that. And hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you're, you know something? When guys like you call us up, right, and you talk like that, you're just making our case for us, okay? You don't make us look bad when you call up and talk like that. You just make you look like an idiot. Of course, no system. Excuse sy- me. Are you, are you are you calling me an idiot? No, sy- no system of morals advocates child molestation. Okay, and you should know that if you if you're not lying to us and if you are in fact a convicted child molester. I okay. want to molest you. Okay, right. Well, that's your problem, <laughs> not ours. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See. Some people have something, have no right. life. Okay, Fred's on line one. We'll see what Fred's up. Hello, I, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can yeah, hear you fine. Can. Okay, I just turned my television down to try to minimize some of the feedback. Yeah. Perfect. This we don't know if it's that or if it's our control room, so. Okay, this is a question I had. If you, um, and I'm not saying that you do, but if you follow the basic scientific belief that there was an Australopithecus and Ramapithecus and Homo habilis, Homo sapien, and Homo erectus, Mm-hmm. That dates those um, living beings that, you know, according to carbon dating and according to some of the, the scholarly, you know, the guys, the findings that they've had on some of these bone structures. Well, there are, that, there are other forms of dating than carbon. Carbon will only take you back 50,000 years. And then before, okay. uh, then you go into radioisometric dating and other forms of, of determining. Potassium argons. Yeah, like yeah, yeah right. determining how you find out how old stuff is. So. All right. Yeah. Well, the, okay. Yeah, I'm glad. And that's the kind of information I would need. The uh, yeah. system, whatever system it was, probably what you just spoke of that they were using, identified these living beings as being here somewhere around one and a half million years ago or even further back. Mm-hmm. And these were some, you know, what's been classified as humanoids or, you know, or at least something that is in the same primate family as we're in. Well, they'd probably be hominids or whatever, early primates or right. something. Like, we're not, we're not, like, biologists and yeah. we're not paleontologists. We and, maybe ought to help, but what, what is yeah. the actual question here? Yeah. The question is, how would... Now, I've read a lot of Ayn Rand, and I've read, read a lot of Leonard Peikoff and some of the objectivist writers of our age and, of, you know, a little bit back. And to accept that there's not something of some level of intelligible matter that's governing these solar systems and galaxies, I mean, if for no other reason, I mean, if for no better question, I'd have to ask, how did man amass the knowledge that he's amassed over a 6,000-year period of time? If they're saying that humans have been on Earth, let's just take, for example, a million years. Mm-hmm. How could you? How could anyone support a system or a scientific system that says that man basically went from horse-drawn carts to space vehicles in 6,000 years, but for the rest of the million-year period, they amass no knowledge whatsoever? Well, I don't. I don't know well, that that's really an, no period, no knowledge. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know that's exactly an uh, an, an accurate way to to uh, of of s- summarizing the history of the species. Yeah. But um, I no, think. Well, I guess what I'm really asking is that all of the historical evidence we have about mankind's dwellings and all of those things about you know the tools that they use as they progress through the different uh-huh. ages. Those things identify, you know, they're pretty rudimentary when we, you know, scale uh-huh. them up against the things that we use in this day and age. Uh-huh. Well, none of the things that they have date back any further than 10,000 years. So if these, mm-hmm. if, if these beings that we're finding these bone, bone remains from, these fossil remains from, mm-hmm. if these things were in fact humans, then why weren't they progressing in knowledge the way humans of this millennium are? Well, I mean, that the uh, if we've had a, about two weeks ago on the show, we had a couple of conversations about this. It was the uh, the development and the evolution of intelligence, not just bio- biological evolution, but how we <clears throat> fit into our niche of yeah. you know the, the 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 type of intelligence that we have, which is we're at least self aware. You know, we're aware of our environment and we have the ability to affect our environment deliberately. And how did that all come about? And that's certainly that's certainly an ongoing field of study. Um, I, I'm not quite sure. I don't have the actual figures of, for example, what the oldest uh, real tools were. I know, for example, that uh, there, there, ha- there have been, there was recently was some discovery, and I believe that was in a burial mound, uh, in which the, the earliest date for abstract thought, where you had like yes, art that yes. indicated you know, that, these were, that these were creatures that had the ability to think in an abstract way, 
uh, we had a recent finding that pushed back the date, you know, a couple hundred thousand years from yeah. before right. it was originally thought. Right. So and that, 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 that what that means is that, that the, clears things up a little. That really does clear things up. It's, you yeah. know, when you're spe especially talking about a span of years that long. Mm -hmm. The other thing I wanted to add in, and I don't want to use up a lot of you guys' time. Huh. Um, it's just as offensive to me when I hear callers like the last caller who, you know, you know, calls and just really, really tries to ridicule the program because I really enjoy mm -hmm. open forums like this where people, you know, who spend a little time reading or spend a little time watching documentaries mm -hmm. can kind of, you know, throw their thoughts up against each other. Yeah. I'm from well, some people, right. some I'm people, from hmm? so I was just going to say some people's uh, response to uh, hearing any point of view that is contrary to their beliefs is to go on the defensive and to just attack. Right. You know, some people just don't know better than that, and right. we can't help that. But you know, we just have to let them know. Look, you're not yes, going to yes. get. And, and I appreciate you know how. You know, you're not. How, see, we like people that. to we like people to disagree with us. I mean, we we want to hear from people who uh, who want to challenge us with uh, you know questions that right. uh, you know because there's not enough of that in television and our, our radio or what have you. And, and a lot of times, if you get a lot of these shows where there's a real ideologue uh, behind the mic, like Rush Limbaugh or Bill O'Reilly or somebody like that. And you just anybody who calls that show and wants to uh, really disagree with them strongly, he'll, they'll be shut out. Right. They'll hang and, up yeah, on them. They won't let them call back. The yeah, and so that's fine. You know, I mean, so we 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 encourage uh, you know that sort of uh, openness in, in well, the dialogue. In the future, I definitely plan on calling back. Like I was I was explaining, mm -hmm. I'm from the far right. I mean, very very far right. I wouldn't say go as far as say I'm ultra conservative, mm -hmm. but I definitely have a lot of viewpoints that are based on traditionalist Christ, uh, Judeo Christian values mm -hmm. and. Um, I, for one, are, you know, I'm definitely ready to li at least examine these things and look mm -hmm. at, you know, I guess through plowing through the Bible, I found so much information in there that was so sexist and so, yeah. um, uh, rigidly socialist that, that these things mm -hmm. had to have been added in by different authors. Mm -hmm. Well, when people just blindly accept the Bible at face value and say that this is some type of holy writ or that mm -hmm. it is a, um, Un, untouched document, you know, and it hasn't been touched, you know, for political reasons or for any level of personal gain. Which it has. Yeah. yeah. Which it has. The Bible itself did not build Christianity. Mm -hmm. Christianity built the Bible. Yeah. The Bible, Christianity predates our written Bible that we have right now that was given us by St. Jerome mm -hmm. about 400 A.D. Christianity precedes this by some 400 years. Yeah, and, and it was, and it was a, um, the, there was a 200 year process where they were developing the New Testament canon. Yes, and there was a long, uh, I mean, two hundred years worth of debates saying right. this book belongs, that book doesn't belong, this one's divinely inspired, this one isn't. And by the time, as you were saying, I think three ninety four hundred A.D., when the final canon was approved, well, at that point, Christianity had the endorsement of the Roman Empire, and yeah, so right. politics and that's my was point exactly one of the worst things about it. Is yeah, one of the worst things about it. Yeah. is that the influence of Saint Paul. Mm -hmm. On the church in that day and age is what added the things that in, you know, my ancestor day and age that allowed people to um, hold on to things like slavery. It wasn't the writings or the, the quotes, apparently, of Christ Jesus. It was the things that were added in from the Apostle Paul mm -hmm. that accommodated things like unequal treatment for women and, you know, a certain way to treat slaves as opposed to the teachings of Christ where he taught you know, don't do to another person what it is that you wouldn't want done to yourself. Well, that would have completely closed the issue of slavery. So the, the, but then there are other passages in which, uh, you know, Jesus, while not exactly necessarily endorsing slavery, says, states clearly, you know, that, uh, you know, the way a slave should behave is to win his, you know, the servant, the first yeah. is, but the, the to, to win the, the approval. Of Paul again. Yeah. Well, that, yeah, that was the Apostle Paul. Yeah. One of the major problems, I think, in the modern day church is mm -hmm. that the writings of a, a Christian man who lived some... 40 or 50 years after Christ Jesus had been crucified, mm -hmm. his writings have been aligned alongside Christianity as it was taught by the people who taught him. Uh -huh. And the problem with that is that he had very, very strong Judeo pressure to oppress women. There, there was pressure from different organizations for him to yeah. treat Jews differently than other people. But my point is, um, I guess I didn't want to stray too far into religiosity, but I will be calling in the future because I think having someone who, who has at least done a little bit of reading about where Christians stand rather mm -hmm. than have some bozo get on the radio and call themselves representing the right yeah. or representing, you know, the uh, moral majority and say that, well, you know, this is this and that is that and, and I don't have to argue with you and I don't have to make sense. 
you know, we don't need those type of people on the radio. So I really, I really appreciate the opportunity to, you know, represent where I stand. Well, you know, uh, yeah, uh, go right ahead. I mean, you know, I think free and open debate is, of course, what a free society is all about. There are people who would like to not see that in play, yeah. but uh, you know, we, uh, in, you know, we'll, we'll uh, you know, feel free to ask us quite any question you see fit, and we'll respond, and you can challenge us back, and what have, what have you. But that is, uh, you know, that to me is always the healthiest way for you know is is for any culture is to have a free and open exchange of ideas. Where people can um, <clears throat> debate and critique and uh, feedback on each other. So thanks a lot for your call, and uh, you know, and, and it's true. You seem to, unlike uh, the majority of the callers we get, you know a little bit about the history of the church, and um, you know, it's not quite as as perfect as uh, they want to make it seem in their own uh, PR. Right, and it's the quest to make it seem perfect, which probably exposes more failure than anything. If I wouldn't tell you mm -hmm. from the beginning that I'm an A student, mm -hmm. then you wouldn't have to lambast me for bringing C's home. <laughs> take it easy. All right, well, you take care. Thanks, uh -huh. All right. Yeah, debate okay. is definitely always a good thing. Um, that's one reason why I, I like our email list. Uh -huh. Because I may seriously disagree with some people on there, and any idea that you hold, you know, with any importance, you should be able to debate it, and mm -hmm. defend it, and it should stand up to critiquing. Yeah. You know, to yourself, to nobody else. But yeah. you shouldn't just say, you know, I believe such and such, and therefore I don't want to discuss it. I don't want to hear anything else. Let me just read you a quick quote. Because, is... you know, I'm scared that if you if you argue with me, mm -hmm. I may stop believing it. Okay, this is a man... If you, if you fear that, that's not good. Okay, this, this is from D. James Kennedy. This is the point of view from the man who, like, really wants to influence American politics. He wants to... I mean, uh -oh. he, want, he wants to reshape America. This is what he has to say. The Holy Bible forms the foundation of our faith. It is more than a book. As Christians, we believe it to be perfect, more powerful than a split atom, more true than death and taxes, and more reliable than the most sober and studied historian. We believe, in fact, the Bible... Bullet. Well, right, uh, that's... Okay, the word for that is dogma. Okay. Yeah. And at that point, you're not going to get any sort of debate taking place exactly. that has any meaningful content, because right here you have people who are not interested and who are shielding themselves. Yeah. And in fact... Uh, Kennedy does this elsewhere in the book. He comes up with, uh, you know, ways in which he's able to shield himself from serious questions, penetrating questions, uh, from really hardline skeptics. Because at the beginning, he just, he, he, he comes up with this way of saying that basically if a skeptic is a pain in the ass, and he keeps asking you a bunch of questions that you don't want to answer, then, well, he's not an honest skeptic, so you can dismiss him. He's just a guy who's, <laughs> you know, he's just got a, he's just The ones with the good a, arguments? Yeah. Leave them alone. Yeah, he just wants to give, they just want to give you a hard time and play mind <laughs> yeah, games exactly. with you. That's what he calls it. He says mind games. So anytime you ask D. James Kennedy well, a question, they're valid. He, doesn't, he doesn't want to answer. <laughs> it's a mind game. So that's, that's the thought process that's going on there. Now, who do we have? Alora is on too? Uh, okay, well, we'll see what you have to say. And that phone number to call is live right there on your screen. We still have a half an hour to go, so go ahead and get those calls in. Hi, you're on the air. Hi. Hey. Ah, hello. Yes. Um, I just want to say that uh, as far as religion goes, I mean, I've been an atheist agnostic for eight, nine, ten years. I don't know. Um, I was really, I'm only 21 now, and I started when I was like 10, mm -hmm. and really haven't changed my mind since then. Um, I've gone from agnostic, atheist, liberal to Republican to more libertarian. Mm -hmm. So, um, just run around. And, you know, uh, for the longest time, I really had a, almost just a hatred towards the, the general ignorance uh, in, in religion and just the hypocrisy mm -hmm. that you see all the time. Um, but the more I learned that I think is so important and to realize in any debate, I, I first of all, I go to so many people is that they forget in the social sciences, mm -hmm. nothing is 100%. Yep. Nothing. So mm -hmm. every time, you all, whenever you say generally or most of the time or, or any kind of those statements, they automatically assume you're saying, oh, but you're talking about everyone. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah. then you always have to re-clarify in every single debate and it's mm -hmm. so annoying. Yeah. yeah. That people always make that ridiculous assumption yeah. all the time. There are a few in our group actually that that have the idea that there is no God. Not the not the idea that I don't believe there's a God or I really, really, really doubt it, 
but there is none, period, 100%. Well, now, hang on. Uh, there, there's one member of our group who has made an Wonder argument. Two. Yeah. Okay, one of, in fact, I like, I'm, I want to get him on the show here in a couple of weeks. Because he's made it, he has created an interesting argument for strong yes. atheism. Okay, so that's which a is super, being super able to say just flat out, it, it, not yeah. just I don't believe in God, but there isn't one, and it yeah, all gets period. down to definitions. And he makes the interesting point that um, you know uh, the way in which believers define their God is usually so, even, even if you're talking about a member of a, an established faith, yeah. is so uh, unique into the, their own experience. It's very individualistic. They have yeah. this idea of some sort of divine being who has some sort of deliberate uh, purpose in mind and for them, and it does this, that, and the other thing. And as you start sounding them out to really, really become clear on the way they define their God, they're more or less defining a being that can't possibly exist in, for anyone but themselves yeah. in a certain way. Yeah. You know, there's no real general meaning that you can find that makes every single believer happy, oh you know, God. in terms of what God is. Yeah. And at that point, you know, if you just end up having a bunch of people saying, like our previous caller, um, the gentleman uh, who, um, I, th I think two callers previous, uh, the guy who uh, said that, well, you know, he, he, I think he said he had some Native American beliefs about some higher power thing, okay. that, and then that was what gave him guidance. But, you know, by its very nature, that sort of claim just isn't verifiable. And so if it's not verifiable, if there's no real way you can land a, a, a solid definition of it, that can say, oh yes, well this can be, this can apply in most circumstances and it can be verified independently. Well then, what's really the point of even talking about? All you've got is a person saying, there's something in my life that I believe in that makes me feel good. Yeah. And beyond that, the, 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 you know, God doesn't have, seem to have much substance. Yeah. Other than it's this in ingredient in a person's life that they attach everything that is good in their lives. Yeah. You know, that they, they attach that meaning to. And and but to claim that it's it's it's, it's any sort of an independent entity, uh, you know, like this cup yeah. or this table is is much more problematic. Yeah. You know, so in that regard, you probably could you know you, you could mount an interesting defense for the argument that, you know, for example, you could have some all powerful divine uh, some deity creating universes and still and and that deity could be something of an idiot you know not or something of a tyrant or something of a really really bad being that wouldn't be a god in terms of this is the being whose uh, outlook on life and whose philosophy and whose uh, moral codes would be something that I would even care to live by or worship or what have you i mean if you had if you if if we found out that this universe was all an experiment from an alternate universe with a bunch of highly advanced aliens well that would be neat but would we worship them yeah. would we call them gods I mean, what's the difference between a god and a highly super advanced space alien who does stuff that we can't comprehend? Yeah. Except how you decide you feel about him. So isn't God really all attached, you know, uh, isn't the concept of God attached to the individual feelings of the believer in so many ways? Well, I believe I that know. in so many ways, religion is just yet another institution of man. It's, mm -hmm. it's created by man. No. And no. like so many other things, like government, like mm -hmm. our invention. It has good sides and it has bad sides. I mean, generally speaking, I believe in the wisdom of the Bible, but I don't believe really in God or the dogma or the all the little ceremony stuff that's involved in it. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know? Um, yeah. But even going back to that, I believe in the wisdom that is in about this much of the Bible. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I yeah. The rest of this is kind of fluff. Song. Yeah, or scary or fluff. Or <laughs> yeah, uh, and, that, and that's where, where it all is. And mm -hmm. that, that's not one page, it's not three pages, but other than, than that, you know, the thing is like, you know, don't be a lazy slob and treat people with respect. Those things that you yeah. can... It's, I've made this argument before. Is Well, it's kind of an argument on um, is the golden rule treat people as you have yourself treated? Is that common sense speaking or is that Jesus speaking? You can have that same attitude and not mm -hmm. believe in God. And so many religious people feel like, well, Jesus, if you don't believe in God, you're not a moral person. Yeah. Well, of course, you know, Conf Confucius is, is quoted as saying something almost identical to the golden rule 500 years before Jesus. Yeah. Right. So, you know, in a sense, it's... No real principle in the Bible is new to the Bible. Yeah. Essentially, they're all from previous, you know, don't steal, don't kill. 
Yeah. You know, you're going to find those in things well before the Bible ever came along. Yeah, so. I mean, there there are cultural norms that uh, that developed as a result of, hmm, gee, how do we make a civilization that can survive and mm. not self-destruct? Well, yeah. one way is cooperation. Uh, and, uh, you know, and that's how things work within civilizations. And uh, I'm reading another uh, interesting book right now. It's called The Bible Unearthed, which talks specifically about the development of the early Bible and how it pertains to... The situation in uh, the kingdom of Judah, which is where I think most of the uh, the text of the Old Testament was set down, um, in about the seventh century BCE, and uh, it, it does have a lot to do with the reason it with all of these. There are a lot of oral traditions, and a lot of it is history, and a lot of it is also just um, you know, cultural myths and stories and oral traditions. And this was all set down at a specific time in the history of the Israelite people as a way of Okay, I mean, you find out that national myths, as it were, like, uh, you know, something like the Odyssey or the Iliad yeah. or what have you, they always tend to come about, you know, Gilgamesh, at a certain point in a civilization's development. And that's usually when it's like, okay, we've got kind of a loosely knit culture going, and we want to really tie this all together. We want to give our people, the group of people, you know, that we yeah. are, we want, we want an identity. We want a cultural identity. We want a political and a geographical identity. Yeah. And we want to, from that, then, you know, take that as our basis and then we'll move forward from there. And this is so, and, and, the, and the early texts of the, the Old Testament, you know, you see at this, at, you know, archaeologi- some, some archaeological findings and evidence of these uh, early days of, uh, the king- in the kingdom of Judah, which is where Jerusalem, Jerusalem not Jerusalem, Jerusalem <laughs> was, and then uh, the kingdom of Israel, which was north. And the, the two kingdoms, and the, they eventually became united, and then what have you. But uh, you you see, there's archaeological evidence of you know where it, what you can see in that evidence of where the kingdom was at, at its particular development at that time, and tying it into the writings of the Bible. It's, it's very interesting. I'm still going through the books. I haven't all finished it. Yeah. But um, you know, you do uh, you know you, you, when you understand the reasons why these religions develop and these belief systems develop. You know, and of course they're man-made institutions, but a lot of it, you know, and it's not always just, oh, let's control the masses and have them all. I mean, a lot of it is, is, in a sense, can be very benign in terms of, you know, wanting to have something there that's good for a yeah. people to latch onto and yeah. say, this is ours. You know, and, you know, and especially the Old Testament, this is all about the Jews and specifically their development of their nation and their relationship to their God. Yeah. You know, and, and, and the Bible and the, the first setting down of the text of the Bible was the attempt to, Really put that down and have it permanently, uh, you know, codified. Oh, you know, but yeah. it's, you know, religion and and the facets of, of government and mm-hmm. culture are all very ancient, mm-hmm. and they're all when you really analyze it, they're all very abstract too. Mm-hmm. And there's no doubt um, that the that there's archaeological evidence of the Bible. There's lots of it. There's the dead. There's the museum. I can't think of the name, but it has mm-hmm. lots and lots of proof that these writers, these people, actually existed. Mm-hmm. There's no doubt in my mind about that. Yeah, there, I mean, there are a lot, there's a lot of uh, archaeology that does lend weight to uh, a lot of the Old Testament. Um, uh, events and some of the Old Testament events and some of the characters in the Old Testament being actual historical people. But then there's a lot that you cannot be confirmed with archaeology, and so it's a matter of sifting through what is legend and what is actual history. Um, and and it's, it's only very recently that real serious archaeology has been uh, applied to the problem of let's get down to the past, you know, the, the ancient history of these people, and really find out what led to the creation of the Bible, led to uh, the writing of it, uh, um, what inspired the stories that are in it, what was taken from other cultures, what was not, you know, what is unique uh, to these people and what have you. Right. And so. Even then, I mean, there can be lots and lots of physical evidence. Mm-hmm. But even then, you're, you're still late. Um, that physical evidence isn't much because there's still that problem where, great, you physically prove the, the Bible and that these writers it. But where do you get into this actual spiritual and this actual hell and yeah. Yeah. the God and yeah, the supernatural claims are something else entirely. Yeah. yeah if you right. prove that Jerusalem exists because it's in the Bible, that's a big step from proving God exists. Yeah. And, so. you know, the, the most smartest people who have ever lived have really questioned faith, and they have had an atheist agnostic attitude. And so 
starting with with Isaac Newton, not starting with him, but he was certainly one of the most famous. Uh, I don't know what his his beliefs were. I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, were, well, what he believed was, of course, being um, in a much more Christian world, he mm -hmm. couldn't be too outlandish about what he felt. Mm -hmm. But just through his his studies and being scientific minded, it's very hard to be scientific minded and to believe in God. Honestly, in my yeah. opinion, because of the whole evolution. well, you have to do a lot of rationalizing. Right. It would seem. Um, but yeah, no, it's all. Um, but just, anyway, he he just felt that uh, he felt was one of the first people that felt that God existed, but he wasn't this involved God that Christians made him out to be. He was oh, so dead, early or, an early deist, or right? What have you. Yeah. So the first one to have this almost attitude of God not existing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I know it was uh, that was certainly a heresy back then. <laughs> it's uh, not a not a not a pleasant uh, a road to go down uh, in that day and age. But um, wow, well, that's well, you know, um, you know, we have uh, you know for all unbelievers, you know, uh, in in the audience, just in the audience, just letting you know about uh, again our bagel shop meetings, our Sunday mornings at ten thirty. If you uh, want to come down and meet more unbelievers like yourself, that's sort of free to everyone. And um, you know, it's really interesting. You sound like you've certainly read up a lot on a lot of this stuff. Thank you. All right. Yeah, and uh, call us back any time, okay? Okay, thanks for taking my call. Hey, thank thanks you. For Take care. Bye. Oh, yeah, a couple of some well-read people on the show today. <laughs> uh, I was going to make um, just one more comment about uh, we had an earlier caller when you mentioned about like, having read all the objectivists. Yeah. And, um, you know, Jeff D. is, is very much <laughs> anti-objectivist. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I haven't really, I admit, I haven't read a lot of Ayn Rand. I don't, you know, I look at these books and I just don't want to plow through them. <laughs> uh, but, uh, no, so, but I asked Jeff like what his big beef uh, was on objectivism, and apparently it has to do with the fact that objectivists, uh, like many Christians, claim to believe in that there is this thing called absolute truth. Yeah. That there are absolutes, and that through objectivism, they say you can find them. Yeah. Just like Christians say through our beliefs, you can find yeah. out what absolute truths are. And now, in a sense, you can talk about objective truth in the physical sense. Of course. But in terms of your philosophy... Are uh, like moral absolutes, things like that. You're getting into a much stickier, grayer area, yeah. where I you know, where I just don't think. No, that you can claim you can you can latch onto philosophy and say this is what gives me all the answers, and I don't have to look at anything else. Yeah. I think the minute you do that, you're engaging in dogma. Yes. And you're not really, uh, you know, uh, being a critical thinker. Yeah. And see, that to me is much more important. So, so in that sense, yeah, you could probably get a lot of uh, um, people in the objectivist community who reject religion who are atheists. And, uh, in fact, I think Ayn Rand was atheist. Yeah. But she <laughs> essentially replaced God with herself, right? <laughs> I mean, she could be the person. And again, there's also a lot of objectivist philosophy yeah. that I do agree with. I, I haven't I read like, into it all that I much. I like the idea of, you know, but, always use your reason to, you know, as your yeah. judge in life, which is good common sense advice. Yeah. But, you know, how you then tie that in with an idea of, well, but then objectivists have their, you know, a handle on what's absolutely true and real. Yeah, that's uh, a bit questionable there. Yeah. So, so. Uh, I think, you know, obviously the reason is the best guide you've got. You yes. know, just being able to think clearly and critically is the best guide you've got. Yeah. You know, it's the best tool at your disposal. Not to say everyone knows how to use it properly. You know, even, even people who do know how to use it very well can make mistakes. Yeah. We're all fallible. You know? Of course. I think that there is, is definitely a desire, and you see this in some religions, but, uh, and, and I think you see it definitely in Christianity and a lot of mainstream religions with their more ardent followers. But I think you also see it in philosophies like objectivism is you get these people who really, really want to be infallible. Yeah. And they want to be, um, I mean, they, they, they want, they have this need to just think that they know everything. You know, and I don't think, I mean, you know, we might talk a good game, but we don't know everything, right? I mean, you know, we, we can certainly, uh, you know, we can, we at least have positions that we can defend articulately. Exactly. You know, which is different from saying, well, I know it all. Um, because don't you find that, I mean, that that's, that's a thing that when we get creationist callers up, can you tell that that's a thing that really, really bugs them? It's like, well, if science can't explain this, then it's got to be this, that, and the other. Yeah. And you, you get the distinct impression that what makes them uncomfortable and, I'm not trusting of science is the fact that um, if you have an answer you don't know, in science, the appropriate thing is to say, well, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, and let's and find out. Not, and they're not satisfied with that. They'd much rather say, oh, well, then, well if science can't answer that question, well, then yeah. that proves it's got to be God. Yeah. Well, no, no you it don't. Doesn't. It's not about, okay, you, you, your knowledge extends to a certain level. 
Yeah. And then beyond that, you have everything you don't know, and at that point, you're free to just insert beliefs. Yeah. In and especially gaps. on the creationist side of things, uh -huh. if you do find a scientific um, idea that all of a sudden they find new evidence that disproves it, that does not mean that you then immediately get to plug religion into it and God into it. Mm -hmm. If all of a sudden tomorrow, you know, tomorrow they find some incredible new evidence that evolution never happened, we all just poofed on the earth, mm -hmm. that does not put religion in its place. Yeah. We can't just all of yeah, a sudden the accept, still them, have to accept the Christian Bible. Yeah, the they still, still have, have to prove to themselves. Yeah, and advance a, a testable theory of creation. Yeah. They'd have to publish it. Exactly. It would have to undergo peer review, and it would have to be shown to be robust and, exactly. and sturdy. And, if and they can provide some proof, I'm all yeah. for them. Yeah. But you have to provide some proof. Yeah. You can't just poke holes in everybody else. Mm -hmm. So. And unfortunately, that's really all that creationism does. You know, it's just oh, yeah. it's it's about it's not really about proving their position. It's yeah, most most of the science. creationist books are not anything about you know here's why you know creationism makes more sense. Yeah. It's why here's all the problems with evolution that we've found. Mm -hmm. And so, since evolution is wrong, you know, you can believe our idea. Well, it may, so. you know, many of the problems that they think it has aren't problems at all. They're just questions, they're misunderstood questions, exactly. deliberate distortions and what have you. Yeah, but yeah. Anyway, well, we're getting off topic, and we've, <laughs> but we've allowed a couple more callers to line up. So we're going to start with Steve on three. Got 15 minutes left in the show, gang, so keep those calls coming. Hey, you're on the air. Hi. Hey. Hi. How you doing? What's up? Um, I was just calling because you were talking about uh, the proof on... Uh, about uh, strong atheism, and I just wanted to uh, see if you guys had read um, this author named uh, Michael Martin. Uh, I've got one of his books, yes. The Atheism of Philosophical Justification. That one, no, I haven't got that. I've got The Case Against Christianity, which is where he just talks about the historical basis for Christian claims. Okay. I haven't read Philosophical Justification, though. I'd like to. It would be interesting. Uh, yeah, I, actually, I got it uh, about a month ago. I'm going through it. It's, it's extremely dense, mm -hmm. and um, it does require some knowledge of um, philosophy. I, of course, they, they, they say it's for the layman, but it's still mm -hmm. pretty dense. Yeah, you kind of um, need to know what you're... You've done a little homework, I guess. Yeah, you have to know what... Uh, um, you know, a little bit of logic theory and whatnot. But anyway, it's split into two halves. Um, the first one is on what he calls negative atheism, which is basically the non-belief in God. And then mm -hmm. the second half is on positive atheism, which is the belief that there is no God. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you're interested in a lot of the uh, proof, you know, so to speak, or let's just say arguments about mm -hmm. Uh, positive atheism is a really great book. And they also, in the appendix, he has lots of um, definitions. Like one thing that I, I never really knew was that it was Aldous Huxley that uh, coined the phrase agnosticism. Th Thomas Huxley. Yeah. Thomas Huxley, his brother. Or a cousin, something like that. I, I don't know if was, I don't know if they were related at all. I don't know if, it was, if someone can fill us in on that. I'll have to look that up to see if Thomas Huxley was related to Aldous Huxley. But, okay. Oh, he was. Okay, they okay. were. They were. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, that was really interesting. Uh, so it's it's a great book. It's very dense. You probably have to read it two or three times yeah. in order to get through <laughs> it. But it does talk uh, about positivism, uh, atheism, and mm -hmm. some arguments uh, in favor of it. Interesting. Okay. Well, appreciate Thanks. that info. All right, thanks for your call, Steve. Yeah, yeah, I have seen the book and I'm familiar with Michael Martin. And uh, he's uh, um, the case against Christianity is um, very interesting in the way he treats uh, specific, not so much the divine beliefs, but spe the specific historical claims. Okay. Did, okay. You know, did Jesus exist at yeah. all? Yeah. Did the yeah. resurrection actually happen? If Jesus existed, what uh, you proof do we have for the miracles? What have you? Yeah. And that's very in depth. And of course, he gets into. A lot of or what we were talking about earlier in the program, which is the history of the early church and how the New Testament canon was put together and combined with the Old Testament, what yeah, have you. Yeah. And you, which, incidentally, is not any history that you will hear. Of course. You will not read any of this history in Skeptics Answered, right? Okay, D. James Kennedy, in his chapter about how do we know the Bible's true? How can we? And he uses Bible prophecy. <laughs> okay, and then this is how we know it's true. We know the Bible's true because the this Bible is how says we know it's true. A, yeah, this is how we know it's a supernatural <laughs> document. And he tries to point to all of these uh, Old Testament passages that he claims were fulfilled prophecies of Jesus. Yeah. And then if you, but I actually went back and read my Bible, right? And, and found all of the actual scriptures that he was quoting. Okay. And in every single case, they're either just plain not prophecies of any kind, 
Yeah. Okay. They were, they, and if they were prophetic passages, they were passages of this future messianic leader who would come along. That wasn't Jesus because the messianic leader they were prophesying was this great warlord who would raise a battle standard and <laughs> bring all of the nations yeah. of the earth together to vanquish the foes of Satan and God will send his armies to swoop down on Egypt and, you know, and then you'll have to, and the, the rivers will, you know, you know dry up and, and, every, and what have you. And it's yeah. just sort of like, hmm, Jesus didn't do any of that stuff. You know, it wasn't <laughs> like that. So again, it all just goes to show just how free they are, not only how free fundamentalist Christians are like D. James Kennedy with their interpretations, but you also had, remember we get back to the political aspect of it, where you have the New Testament writers were definitely familiar with these Old Testament passages. Yeah. And so in John, you'll see a lot of like passages, particularly pertaining to, say, the crucifixion, where the author of John will say something like, and so that scripture would be fulfilled... Yeah. <laughs> they cast lots for Jesus' clothing, right? Yeah. And you go back to the original psalm that they're saying is a scripture that would be fulfilled, and it's not any sort of a prophetic scripture. Yeah. It's like David in his laments talking about how everybody's giving him a hard time. Yeah. And We uh, read that this is supposed to happen, so we're going to make it happen. Yeah, it's, these are, these, the, you know, there's a good case to be made for the New Testament writers just arbitrarily deciding, oh, well, here's, here's a psalm that I'll say was a prophecy of Jesus, and this guy will be... The full, you know, is, yeah. is fulfilling that prophecy. <laughs> Why? Because at that point, I think there was, there was def- some definite, uh, yeah. you know, a political agenda going on in yeah. terms of, uh, you know, uniting the, the Judean people underneath, you know, yeah. this, because they were under the yoke of Rome. And so there was, uh, yeah. again, this very, very, very much of a, an impetus to, uh, you know, create this strong uh, nationalism. Yeah. So, anyway, all very interesting, but you won't get, to, you know, that interesting history reading, you know, works of Christian apologetics like this thing. So, uh, yabba. Who's next? We have Fred, and then we have Mike. We'll go to Fred first and see what he has to say. Ten minutes left, gang. Hey, you're on the air? Hi. Hey, what's going on? Hi. Um, there's a book called, uh, The Culture of Ayn Rand. Okay. And, uh, I, that may not be the exact name. I'll send you an email if it isn't. But it talks about the negative aspect of, of the objective move, movement in mm-hmm. the 60s. Okay. And in, was this when Ayn Rand was having all her adulterous affairs and? Oh yeah, and the, and the true believers are the uh, um, people or followers who are behaving like true believers. Yeah. yeah. And her disdain and, and attack on her own following rival that of the uh, now supposed leader of Iraq. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. And, and I uh, I wasn't part of it, but I was friends of people who were. Mm. So I can say that their experience is uh, accurately depicted in the book, although I can't uh, defend the book entirely because the book also claims that all of the ideas that she had, like you said about the Bible, weren't original to her mm-hmm. right. or found by other philosophers. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, on the issue of the possibility of God, uh, I just had a question for you. Uh, I reckon, or at least I have my opinion, is that the ultimate right each person has that can't be taken away from them by anybody is the right to decide what is knowledge to him, what is belief to him, what different words like possibility mean to him. That's just everybody's decision and nobody can take that away. In my uh, particular belief, there's no one claim God exists and I would prefer it. But if someone says there's a possibility that God exists, or there's a possibility you can talk to the dead, or there's a possibility of or any of the others, mm-hmm. I demand proof as well. Otherwise, I don't allow even the possibility. Yeah, well, the minute somebody makes a testable claim, you know, the minute they put... Th- you know, a lot of believers, you'll find they'll say, oh, well, you know, science is good up to a point, Right. But then beyond that, there's, you know, other stuff that science can't really explore, and so we need to just believe in that stuff and blah, blah, blah. But the, what they don't realize is that the minute they make a testable claim about their beliefs, like, my, you know, so-and-so can talk to dead people, or I have psychic powers that enable me to know what the weather's going to do, okay? The minute they make a testable claim, they are putting their beliefs squarely within uh, science's, uh, you know, purview. All right, but and where I, I disagree with you guys well, is that I claim that if you, you guys make the claim that something is possible, I put that squarely in an area which requires evidence as well. So 
when you guys say there's a possibility that God exists, or the possibility of Clara Boyd speaking to the dead, because you guys have said that many times, I would, I would say that that requires the same degree of proof as someone who makes a claim that yeah. something does exist. Am I? So I just want to. I'm, yeah. I'm going to hang up. The, I'm going to finish my question. I'm hanging up the phone, so I really can't hear you well. Yeah. yeah sorry. We'll uh, we'll go ahead. We'll we'll respond to that. Thanks okay. for your call. Okay. My main issue with that is that when you immediately, if you say that there is no proof, and therefore you know we don't know about something, speaking with the dead, um, if you immediately say, well, we have no proof, therefore it's impossible, then you have just become as dogmatic as those who have said it is possible. Well, I'll let you go on. And so, I mean... Yeah. Well, no, here's the thing. Martin will reply to that. Well, no, here's the thing, though. Actually. But, I mean, but just having to say that everything is either completely real or it's completely hogwash, okay. it, well, I mean, it, it's okay. not that black and white. There's, there's no such thing as a square circle. Exactly. Okay. I mean, so it is, po- it is possible for, for, something, for things to be impossible. Of course. But and there are three categories is, here. Yeah. There is completely impossible. Right. There is the, we don't know, we're looking into it. Yeah. And there's the... Well, what we you can say about something so. like talking to the dead, right, is that if you say, all right, what is the possibility that spirits actually exist and they want to communicate with the living and for some reason they don't choose to communicate directly with their surviving loved ones, but they want to go through some clown on television. Yeah. Or whatever. But <laughs> it's possible. Well, what, what I would look at is the fact that it's not so much, okay, if you want to say, it, if it, it's, it's not like evidence, evidence, absence of proof, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Yes. Okay. But absence of evidence isn't proof either. Of course. Yeah. So at the same time, you know, the, the important thing is if you look at all the evidence that is available for people who make psychic claims, okay, or people who make talk to the dead claims or what have you, and none of that evidence is supporting their claim that they are, in fact, talking to dead things or seeing ghosts or taking rides on the back of the Loch Ness Monster or what have you like that, if none of the available evidence that we've gotten so far is shoring up those claims, then if, if you don't want to say then it's just an out-and-out impossible claim, you could at least say that the probability is so right now, right down there near nil, that it's not even a thing worth discussing the possibility of. Exactly. And if the caller was saying that due to all the evidence that we have mm-hmm. acquired, knowledge, logic, whatever, mm-hmm. that, you know, we can't have a God based on all of that, then that's a debatable point. Well, anybody can have but any simply, God. Yeah. But simply the statement that yeah. God exists. Yeah. Now, without going into the definitions and the logical arguments pro and for and stuff like that, mm-hmm. um, I, I don't think you can just immediately say it's complete hogwash. Impossible. Well, like I said, any, if someone, I, I if someone so. chooses to worship the sun and call the sun God, exactly, then God exists. For the, I'll be able to, I'll be happy to point to the sun and say that guy's God exists. I don't call it a, but I don't call it God. It doesn't match what I think. Yeah. Like, this could probably be getting back to the Paul definitions Wilson's part. part so yeah. we're gonna try to take one more caller at the end. It's Mike on two, and then uh, we only have about a minute. So one quick question for us, Mike, and then uh, we'll try to answer you. Hey, hi guys. Thanks, Thanks for holding. For, uh, Thanks for uh, taking my call. Sure. Uh, I don't know if we have time to get into this again, but I wanted to go back to your earlier point. Um, um, I have my TV turned down. So. That's fine. Okay. It's it's the con- it's the the setup here. It's all messed up. Okay. Um, um, I want really to go back quickly. To your earlier point about um, I think objectivism and possibly mm-hmm. relativism with respect to moral code. Uh huh. And um, it, 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 I'm a Christian and. Uh-huh. and whether or not we agree to, to disagree, uh, you know, on on the, on the values set aside in Christianity, um, I, I have an atheist friend, and often we, we talk about um, in the absence of, a, of some absolute written down somewhere. As an atheist, how do we do it? Yeah, we'll we start. We'll start with that next Sunday. How about? Okay. Okay. Well, but we're all done for today. We're out of time, and thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. Wow. And if you want a preview to it, there's always our fact page. There is a fact page there, yeah. We are really sorry again about the phone sound. It's been doing this for weeks, and it's not your TV. We don't know what it is. Again, thank you for tuning in. Uh, and, uh, you know, if that guy was a real child molester and he was telling the truth, I didn't mean to insult him, but it sounds like a lot of the kind of crank calls we get, okay? Yeah, I'm sure it was. But tvdatheist-community.org, our uh, email uh, page for viewer feedback. Thank you to Ashley, my fine co-host as always. Thank you. 
Uh, we may have a guest next week. Uh, thanks to Crystal Crew, blah, blah, that's everybody. Thank you, Russell Glasser, again. Uh, uh, theists, we don't hate you, we just, just think, think you're wrong. wrong. Bye-bye. Goodbye, everybody.